So I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Shokut M. Tarawa as tonight's keynote speaker. Professor Tarawa was raised in London, Paris, Hong Kong, and Singapore. He attended the University of Pennsylvania where he discovered Arabic literature and took a BA in Arabic and Islamic studies, an MA in modern Arabic literature, and a PhD in classical medieval Arabic literature. He has taught Arabic at Duke University, medieval French literature and Indian Ocean studies at the University of Mauritius, and Arabic and Near Eastern literatures at Cornell University. He has also worked in family import-export companies in Kuala Lumpur and in Port Louis. In 2016, he joined Yale University as professor of Arabic. His scholarly interests include the literary and writerly culture of 9th and 10th century Baghdad, on which he wrote his first book, quote, Ibn Abi Tahir Tayfur, an Arabic writerly culture, a 9th century bookman in Baghdad. The Quran, in particular, Hapaxi's rhythm, rhyme words, and translation, a book titled The Quran, Literary Dimensions, is forthcoming, and the fabled Wakwak tree and the Wakwak islands, the 18th century Indian author and Arabic bell lecturist, Azad Bilgrami, modern Arabic, uh, modern Arabic and world poetry, which he also translates, Creole language literature of Mauritius, his parents and his wife's home, translation and science fiction and literature. And I apologize if I messed up any of the semicolons in that. So. Um, his life is made perfect by his wife, Praveen, their daughters, Maria Manasia, and by the family cat, Kotomili. On a personal note, I just want to add that Professor Tarawa was my graduate advisor and intellectual mentor at Cornell. He had a truly indelible influence on the trajectory of my life, and I can honestly say that I would not be standing here before you today if it was not for him. Lastly, I encourage every Yale student to get to know him. You will not be disappointed. Please welcome me, please join me in welcoming Professor Tarawa. In a splendid essay titled The Object of Devotion, Fundamentalist Perspectives on the Medieval Past, and published in the journal Religion and Literature, the medievalist Suzanne Conklin Akbari observes that later scrutinizing the choices she made when writing her first book, Seeing Through the Veil, Optical Theory, and medieval allegory revealed to her that she had engaged in a relentless exclusion of devotional or theological texts. Akbari had earlier assumed that there was a complete disjunction between the extreme Protestant millenarianism of her childhood and the moderate Islam of her adulthood she had converted. But on examining her choices now, realized that she had been drawn to allegory precisely because the pleasures of the figurative word had for so long been held off by fundamentalist modes of reading. The editors of the journal Religion and Literature invited me to reflect on Akbari's essay and also on the larger question animating the special issue in which her essay appears, namely the propriety of scholarship in the humanities produced by those with faith commitments. I immediately agreed because this afforded me the opportunity to put into print some inchoate thoughts I had before only expressed in private. And although I agree with Akbari that recounting one's own intellectual formation is something of an exercise in narcissism, it is with an autopsy and autobiography that I too organize my thoughts. What's more, a large part of the reason that I'm standing here is that it seemed a good idea to Omar and to Lisa that I introduced to the community, the larger community as it were, in this way. And so I think it's entirely appropriate, or I hope it is, that I talk about myself. You'll have to take it on faith that I am relatively humble. And I thank not only uh, the chaplain's office, but all of you for being here. It is truly an honor, and it is an honor also to be sitting opposite the president. I won't share with you the story I heard him recount in his own home the other day uh, about the Swedish meatball, but if you get a chance, you should ask him. I grew up in an observant cosmopolitan family, an expatriate child who was one of a handful of Muslims at an English school in Paris in the 1960s, then one of a very small number of Muslims at an international school in Singapore, but nevertheless immersed also in the culture and cultures of other Muslim and South Asian Singaporeans. My family watched TV and films, 
went to the theater, attended musical performances, listened to records. Those are, I hope all of you know what those are. And at the same time, put up no pictures of people in our homes, did not wear shorts, sat at the beach, or eat proscribed foods, forbidden foods. Periodically, I would visit extended family in Mauritius, where my parents had grown up, in which they had both left. My father left for India, and later for England. My mother left for England, in order to find their place in the world, places in the world. When the time came, I left Singapore for college. Unlike my peers who picked the course they were taking in the UK to read law, read geography, and forest, and biology, I chose to go to the US where I could decide later what I would study, since I had no idea at the time what specific road to travel. Mere months later, to the question, what are you studying, my reply would turn out to be Arabic. Fellow college students, extended family, friends, acquaintances, complete strangers, all responded to this news in the same way, something along the lines of, oh, you study Islam. I did take one Islamic civilization course and one upper level seminar as an undergraduate. By the way, I took those classes with someone who left Penn shortly thereafter for Yale and has been here for the last 30 years. A Jesuit professor, nonetheless. But I was not studying Islam. Most of my classes were on Arabic literary criticism, Arabic literary history, medieval Europe, French literature, the mirrors of princes genre, even astronomy. People still would not, could not understand that I was drawn to Arabic literature the way one was drawn to French literature or African literature or Latin American literature. My non-Muslim friends studying Arabic did not get the kind of response I got. But in my case, I had to be studying Islam because I was, after all, an observant Muslim who was studying Arabic. That my professors and mentors were not Muslim was immaterial. That the poets I studied were typically atheists or Christians was immaterial. That I went on to write a doctoral thesis and book about a figure, a 19th century figure, who, unlike most of his peers, did not write a single book on religion or religious matters, and who did not seem to have any interest in religion at all, for that matter, was immaterial. My parents, on the other hand, did not think I was studying Islam. Perhaps because my mother could picture me tackling and mastering the difference between the Mahdi, the perfect tense, and the Mudariya, the imperfect, just as I had learned the difference in French grammar between the passé saint and the passé composé, although that is not a perfect analogy to being a there. Perhaps because my father could imagine me plumbing Arabic literature for an analog to say, in Xanadu, the Kublai Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree where out the sacred river ran, in heavens, measureless the man down to a sunless sea, lines by Coleridge, which he taught me when I was seven, and which are still deeply implanted in my brain. From my parents, I also learned, Eki Safme Kareho Gaye Mahmoud Ayaz, Nakoe Bandaraha, or Nakoe Bandaraha. Mahmoud and Hayaz stood together on the same flank. The ruler and the ruled forget the difference in rank. A uh, great line by the poet uh, Iqbal. My parents were believing Muslims who spared no effort in teaching me the precepts and practices of Islam. It was, however, equally important to them to impart other values, the virtue of decency to all people, the importance of generosity, especially to children and the indigent, the need for humility before God, before Caesar, and before all people. Gratitude to God, both for who I was and for what I had been given, and for want of a better way of putting it, a respect for the human, the humane, and the humanities. Three times a week, a man by the name of Babusa, Mawlwi Babusa, came to our apartment to tutor me privately. I was still a teenager. He taught me classical religious law in my own right, the Hanafi right, by reading a law book written in Tamil, but in Arabic script. He was Tamil. And we debated any question I would raise, from theodicy to organ donation. At school, the teachers who exerted the most influence on me had me reading poets like Charles Corsley, whose lines I can still recall. From my favorite, then I saw the crystal poet leaning on the old sea rail. In his breast lay death the lover, in his head the nightingale. This is a line about John Keats. And when Cosley goes to Timworth, which is where Keats was visiting his ailing brother who had tuberculosis, Cosley thinks about the poem, thinks about Keats dying himself of consumption, 
and writes, in his breath lay death the lover, because that's the consumption that's killing it, and in his head the nightingale, because he would go on to write, Ode to Nightingale. If that isn't brilliant, then probably nothing is. The teachers also taught me lines by Christopher Marlowe, a line spoken by Mephistopheles, when Dr. Faustus says to him, Where is hell? Mephistopheles says to him, Why this is hell? Nor am I out of it. And of course, he's on earth at the time. Or Albert Camus, on whom I wrote my senior thesis in high school, who immortalized a particular sentiment to Le in Mille de Dieu, the lutte contre la mort, the physician, the enemy of God, he struggles against death. So perhaps it comes as no surprise that early in my undergraduate studies, I felt empowered to study whatever the heck I wanted. As no surprise that I was drawn to literature and to topics medieval. And that for my master's thesis, I elected to translate a poetry collection by someone still regarded as the most significant living Arab poet. Or is it that I did precisely what Suzanne Akbari did? Early in her essay, she observes that the efforts of those of us who teach and study medieval literature to write about the past are colored by our own experience, no matter how hard we work to put that experience to the margins of consciousness. Those are her words. When I picked Arabic, did I studiously avoid classes on Islam? Did I gravitate toward Christian and atheist poets? When I decided to write about Ibn Abi Tahir, who's the subject of my, my dissertation in my first book, is what appealed to me about him precisely the fact that he was not interested in religion and that he wrote the reverent verse? If I had chosen French or African or Latin American literature, no one would have assumed that I was studying Islam. It should go without saying that the distinction is crucial to study Shakespeare is not to study Christianity. Why had I picked Arabic? In doing so, was I forcing the question, forcing myself to study a literature, in fact, steeped in Islam, because, precisely because, I was des desperate to disaggregate and disidentify Arabic and Islam. I spent the next several years emphasizing to anyone who would listen that I was not a scholar of Islam, and I am not. That my field of study was not Islam that Arabic literature was not Islamic studies. That did not stop people from describing me as an Islamist, even though I was sent strict to an Arabist. And because of world events, soon enough the question transformed. You're an Arabist. Do you study the Middle East? I went from being a Muslim who studied Islam to an Arabist who studied the contemporary Arab world. In 1990, in my second year teaching, my last year teaching at Duke University, I received a call from a Durham newspaper asking me for my expert opinion on Operation Desert Storm. I responded by asking the reporter whether the newspaper had contacted the English department when the Falklands crisis erupted. I later did teach an introduction to Islamic civilization class at Duke, no doubt for my sins, a wonderful learning experience for me, but one that blurred lines I had spent and would spend so much energy trying to keep sharply distinct. Three decades and three institutions later, I now see more clearly that different constituencies take responsibility for placing burdens on Muslims teaching Arabic texts in the academy. Most Muslims assume, because I am a Muslim teaching or researching Arabic literature, that I am actually teaching Islam. And if I deny this, for them, it is because I am uncomfortable admitting it. Many non-Muslims, I might add, assume that because I am brown and teaching and researching Arabic literature, that I am Arab which I am not. When I am occasionally called upon to teach Islamic civilization, and I mean occasionally, once at Duke, three times in 16 years of Cornell, I acquire a new set of burdens. Most Muslim students assume I am an objective native informant. Many non-Muslim students assume I am not objective, something I know from the tenor of the questions I am asked in class. I did add introduction to the Quran to the Cornell curriculum, and it was my great honor to have uh, Omar who teach that class with me in, uh, believe it or not, the spring of 2002. And when I do teach that class, which I will not be teaching here, although I commend the class to you next semester, Travis Zadeh, who's sitting here somewhere, I'm wearing reading glasses, I can't see him, uh, who's just hired Gail as well, will be teaching the class on the Quran in the spring. Uh, I tell students when I teach that class, that the idea is to study the Qur'an the way we study Hamlet. And I do this to set the tone for the ensuing analysis and discussion. It is a text that is deserving of scrutiny, deserving of respect, and that we will take apart and put back together. 
I have two agendas besides doing the best possible job to teach the students about the Quran. Namely, to have Muslim students see that non-Muslims have said important things about the Quran, and to have non-Muslim students see that Muslims have said important things about the Quran. Very difficult thing to do, by the way, both of us. One might reasonably wonder why these agendas. My answer can be framed in the form of a question. Are Muslims who teach and write about Arabic, Arabic literature, the Quran, or Islam taken seriously and seen to be objective? Is the burden to establish one's objectivity as great for a Christian teaching a course on medieval Christianity, for a Jewish professor of Jewish philosophy, for a practicing Buddhist instructor of Tibetan? Alas, I can tell you from experience, the answer is no. I am often asked, how do I separate being Muslim from my objects of study? I always want to reply, what is there to separate? But if earlier in my career I could invoke a strong distinction between Arabic literature and Islam, this has become far more difficult now because I have started to write about and translate parts of the Quran. As far as I can tell, I am one of a very small number of people, and I mean very small number of people, interested in the Quranic lexicon as a lexicon only. That is, someone interested in the words, the word choices, the word placements, the end words, how the Quran is put together, how it means and makes meaning. That is to say, as opposed to someone interested in its exegesis, its commentary, law, and any number of other topics. In my articles and essays about the Quran, I make a plea for giving it the rhetorical attention it deserves, for paying attention in particular to such things as hapax phenomena, single occurring words, rare words, and rhyme. In a recent article, for example, I tried to show that close consideration of the repeated words in a very well-known surah, surah 19, the chapter on Mary, Virgin Mary, uh, that if the uh, consideration of those words underscores what one scholar has termed the Quran's aural, oral, aural multidimensionality. And that by producing a word list, which is what I did, a hitherto unnoticed aspect of the surah was revealed, namely its focus on the power and nature of speech and silence. None of my work on the Quran has real dogmatic or theological impact or purchase, so I wonder whether here too I have not forced a question. I do not see how I can deny that among the reasons I picked the study of Quranic words, admittedly generally an area in great need of scholarly attention, is my desire, I dare say my need, to demonstrate the possibility of separating the study of the Quran from the study of Islam. But there is something else. Could it be that as an observant Muslim, or more to the point, an observed to be observant Muslim, I am looking for a way to say to the academy, to Muslims, to non-Muslims, that it is possible for a believer to be both observant and objective, to be both passionate and dispassionate, to be both religious and rigorous. My beard does give me a way, though I went to a barber this morning for the very first time and he chopped most of it off. My beard does give me a way, but not much else. I wear superhero t-shirts. I have the clash as my ringtone. Let's see if I can do this. I'm supposed to know how to do this. Blunt and balling by the clash. I teach classes on the very raunchy Arabian nights. I teach, I hope to teach, I have been in the past, I haven't yet at Yale, classes on apocalyptic science fiction. I did not used to think that I do any of this to make a particular point. I genuinely like Iron Man. And I teach The Watchmen in my classes. It's a graphic novel. I rarely work without Dire Straits or Coldplay or Paul Simon playing in the background. I really like Penelope Cruz and Emily Blunt. But maybe I'm kidding myself. Maybe I want my colleagues, my students, even our daughters, now 22 and 19, and making their own way through a complex and often unforgiving world. Maybe I want all these constituencies to see that it is absolutely, utterly, and serenely possible to have devotion and to be a serious and successful scholar of Arabic literature. When I was five, I spoke only French. A few years later, I also spoke English, and the fruit seller opposite our apartment building in Paris began to call me Le Petit Anglais. He did not call me Le Petit Musulman, right? He called me the little English boy. He meant English speaking boy. He did not call me the little Muslim 
all of his tens, yeah, the little Indian. And he would have been entitled to do so. My mother only wore saris when we lived in Paris. If I can get anyone, get everyone, to see me and people like me as a scholar who teaches Arabic literature, as a scholar who teaches Arabic literature, rather than as a Muslim who does so. And if I can, unburdened, fashion my own modes and idioms of representation, then we will have come a long way, along a much needed journey, a journey I am delighted and thrilled to be on in your company at Yale and in New York. Or to give the poet the last word, which is always a good idea. Here are Theodore Redke's opening lines of one of the English language's greatest poems. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I feel my fate in what I cannot fear. I learn by going where I have to go. Thank you, Mr. Barak.